hello everyone. My name is Graham Meikle and I'm Professor of Communication and Digital Media at the University of Westminster in London. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me to be a part of this event, which I think is most interesting and quite innovative in its approach. Um, I'm going to be talking to you today a bit about deepfake videos and how some of the issues of trust and consent which are raised by deepfakes can be understood in a useful way by using ideas of remix. Um, I'll be drawing in this talk on some material from my recent book on the subject, Deepfakes, um, in which I explore the range of uses to which deepfakes have been put so far, including art and satire, advocacy and persuasion, propaganda and disinformation, technical demos, special effects and music video, alternative histories and resurrecting the dead, and above all, uh, by far the largest use of deepfake videos to date um, in making non-consensual pornographic videos of women. Now, deepfake videos are examples of synthetic media, media that are created or manipulated using artificial intelligence techniques. In the book, I argue that deepfakes are not just significant in their own right, but they also offer important insights into the wider digital media environment of the 2020s. And I argue that deepfakes did not just happen to emerge in the time of social media, but they are a product of those media. The limitless data sets of image and video and text and audio that we have all created together through two decades of sharing on social media platforms, these data sets have now become raw material for AI researchers to train machine learning systems to, to um, recognize, to classify, and to recreate images. And with enough training, such systems can generate entirely new images, uh, copies that have no original. Any person can now be shown to be saying and doing things they have never actually said or done. Um, and deepfakes also expand the, the social media environment in which the public and the personal converge. They are a logical extension of the social media business model in which all human experience becomes data to be exploited. So thinking about deepfakes allows for a new perspective on the, the taken for granted nature of contemporary digital media in which our capacity to create and manipulate and share content increasingly conflicts with our capacity to trust. Um, now trust is central to ideas of communication and community. Trust is fundamental to developing and maintaining a sense of community across space and through time. And trust connects with ideas of belief and faith and truth. In media terms, both news and political communication are built around mechanisms for the manufacture and maintenance of trust. Communication is the making of meanings. And meanings are not just sent, but they're created together with others. And trust is a central element in this creation of meaning. Belief in the reliability of a message, confidence in its source, recourse perhaps to faith. Um, without trust, communication breaks down. In the networked digital environment of the 2020s, our ability to trust is confronted by the near ubiquitous capacity to create and manipulate and circulate media content through social media platforms. And deepfakes are a significant development within this wider erosion of trust, which is affecting experiences of political communication, of news and of social media. A key problem for trust in the contemporary media environment is the ways in which consent is being withdrawn or becoming meaningless. Everyone's face, everyone's image, indeed all human experience is now reusable as media content. This is, as I've said, an extension and an expansion of the social media business model that developed in the first two decades of the 21st century. And as it has developed, ever more aspects of private daily life 
have been appropriated as personal data. In an earlier book, I described social media as the sharing industry, noting how the continual emphasis on pushing users to share more photos, more friendships, more opinions, more emotions, and on further pushing other users to recirculate and reshare those things, how all of this had become a central business model of networked digital media. In a subsequent book about the Internet of Things, co-written with uh, digital theorist Professor Mercedes Buns, we traced how this business model was being expanded into ever more intimate parts of everyday experience, how we were no longer just pushed to share our photos and address books, but also our shopping lists, our daily step counts, our sleeping patterns, our calorie and alcohol intakes, our hormone cycles and heart rates. The point was that none of this had ever been mediated before, and that was exactly why it was of interest and value to the sharing industry. <clears throat> so as this invasive practice of everyday life has become more familiar and more taken for granted, so the cultural lines for its acceptance have shifted. It has become normal, if not yet natural, to yield up ever more access to ever more aspects of our lives. The kinds of consent that we give in clicking through screens is not meaningful, but once given, it means that we did not say no. Surveillance is no longer just the domain of the state, but instead we're developing what David Lyon has described as a culture of surveillance. This share and share alike environment of behavioural profiling and commercial targeting creates the conditions for deepfakes. Anyone's face is now just more zeros and ones. Any new context in which that face can be put is just more content. Anything at all is just data to be taken, to be used. So deepfakes reveal something much more general about our contemporary digital condition. It's not just celebrities and politicians who are being objectified and manipulated. It's all of us. It's not just that we're reduced to our data. It's worse than that we're reduced to other people's data. <laughs> so deepfakes, I think, show us the contours of the environment in which we all now live, an environment in which resistance and consent to digital exploitation are both being made meaningless, an environment in which all human experience is just content and data to be manipulated and remixed. <laughs> so remix. Deepfakes are about creating something new from existing material, about editing, manipulating and subverting images, audio and video. So when I first became interested in researching them, I immediately thought of them as being examples of remix. Um, and I think that one way of approaching deepfakes is to connect them with wider currents of remix creativity and of how this is now a central part of everyday digital life. Think of the ways that your daily use of social media involves making new meanings by reworking found material, whether that is running a photo through a filter before you post it on Instagram, or whether that is sharing a link in a new context by posting it on Twitter, for example, making possible new meanings from both that link and from the context of your Twitter feed. Now, questions of remix became central to digital media and web cultures early in the 21st century. Um, ideas about remix drew upon collage aesthetics and theories of appropriation, of juxtaposition and creative combination from, from the arts and literature of the 20th century, um, from cinema editing, from experimental literature, from visual arts, and from improvisational music cultures, from jazz to, to, to DJ cultures. All of these cultural currents converged with digital technologies as the millennium turned, and the consolidation of the web found expression in 1990s and early 2000s practices, such as culture jamming, tactical media, DIY cultures, and then what we used to refer to as Web2, and what we used to talk about as user-generated content. <laughs> Writers such as Lawrence Lessig and Paul D. Miller 
began to develop new approaches to cultural production, distribution and reception that addressed questions of remix and practices of remix. Um, Lessig argued that the um, mass media of the 20th century had been a read-only culture in which only some people got to, to, to speak and most people got to listen. Only some people got to write and most people just got to read. The 21st century, he said, could be both read and write. In, um, in Lessig's analysis, the, the important dimension here was about intellectual property and the need to reform copyright regimes in order to enable grassroots creativity and practices which were often creating with found material. Um, Paul D. Miller, in his book Rhythm Science and Elsewhere, also um, approached questions of remix as creativity. Um, but for him, it was more about cultural recognition. In this book, he refers to sampling, digital sampling, as ancestor worship and asks the question, who speaks through you. These ideas began to develop by the beginning of the 2010s into a, a loose academic discourse, uh, a subfield, uh, a subdiscipline of uh, remix studies that orbits around concepts of creativity, cultural production and reproduction, ethics, activism, and copyright. Much of the literature on remix is normative and celebratory, often crossing into advocacy. Um, lots of it is rooted in fan cultures, in celebrating and defending the rights of the fan or the grassroots creator over those of the corporation, and in defending remixes against intellectual property laws or other conceptions of authorial creativity. But deepfakes push the limits of this discourse. A non-consensual deepfake porn video of a performer from a Marvel movie is recognisably within the, the video remix currents of the last 20 or 25 years, but it can't be defended with the same arguments about creativity, ethics or intellectual property. And in fact, it can't be defended at all. Um, so how then can ideas of remix help us to understand deepfakes? Well, think of it this way. To remix is to create something new with found material. And with deepfakes, the found material is us. So to explain how deepfakes can be understood as remixes and why this matters, I want to quickly compare two important remix art projects. One from the early emergent phase of remix cultures at the beginning of the 2000s, and one from the early emergent phase of deepfake videos at the beginning of the 2020s. In those, the space between those two decades of development, we can find something very important about what characterizes deepfakes and what characterizes our contemporary digital media environment. The, um, the first video, I want, the first project, sorry, I want to look at is uh, Rebirth of a Nation by Paul D. Miller, uh, DJ Spooky. Um, it's a multimedia remix that he first performed in 2004. Um, it involves taking D.W. Griffith's 1915 feature film, um, The Birth of a Nation, um, and remixing it to, br to bring... 21st century sensibilities and digital techniques to bear on this landmark text of early cinema. Uh, Griffith's film from 1915 was a huge success in its day and was extremely influential in terms of the, in, in formal terms, the, the, the kind of array of techniques that he introduced to cinema. But for many 21st century audiences, it's largely unwatchable because of its open racism its casting of white actors in blackface makeup, and its depiction of the Ku Klux Klan terrorist organization as being heroic. Um, Miller's remix project, Rebirth of a Nation, edits Griffith's film down from three hours to one hour, um, juxtaposing it and counterpointing it with uh, a, new, uh, a new soundtrack that he's composed expressly for it, and bringing out 
um, using um, digital perspectives on screen to highlight some of the more objectionable um, and racist elements of Griffith's film. It creates something new from found material. It takes this 1915 feature film and puts it into collision with 21st century digital techniques and sensibilities. I want to compare that project from the early part of the 21st century with a more recent one, um, Warriors which is a deep fake art installation by James Coop, uh, first exhibited at New York's International Center of Photography in 2020. Um, like Rebirth of a Nation, this project uh, creates something new from an old movie, right? Walter Hill's 1979 feature film, The Warriors. But what Coop does is he remixes the faces of visitors to his exhibit into scenes from Hill's movie. The original film tells the story of a street gang, the Warriors, who have to fight their way from one end of New York to the other uh, and have a series of encounters, uh, set piece fight scenes um, with other street gangs, many of whom are based around a particular demographic characteristic. So there is an all black street gang called the Riffs and there's an all-female street gang called the Lizzies. Visitors to Coop's installation are invited to use one of a set of iPads around the room to take pictures of their own face, which are then analysed and mapped by deep learning software. And the visitors' faces are then assigned to individual characters from different gangs in Hill's movie and appear remixed into scenes from the film on screens throughout the exhibition space, as we see here. <coughs> on the left, the, the two characters there, that's, uh, that's an image from the original movie. On the right, the four characters, those are the faces of visitors to, to Coop's project, which have been remixed into that scene on the, the New York subway from Hill's movie. Coop's project uses deepfake technology to explore questions of identity, visibility, profiling, and algorithmic bias. The, the artwork profiles each individual participant and reduces them to certain demographic characteristics. But the visitor has no way of knowing what criteria the system uses in assigning them per, to a particular group of characters from the movie. So I contrast this project with the Rebirth of a Nation project um, as representing two distinct historical moments of a remix. And the distance between these moments is fundamental to deep fakes and in turn, I think, fundamental to our contemporary digital moment. DJ Spooky's artwork from 2004 remixes media content with his own musical counterpoint and it edits the film in a new way to suggest new meanings. It creates something new from found material, a movie. James Coop's Warriors Project also does this. It also creates new material, new meanings. It creates new meanings from existing material, an old movie. But it does something very significantly different as well. Coop's project is not just remixing a text, but he's remixing its audience. The viewer's own face becomes the remixed text. The found material that is remixed and reused here is us. Deepfake videos reveal how today's network digital media systems take each of us as individuals and process us into data. We are analyzed, classified and profiled with every daily interaction. And the systems that do this run on algorithmic processes that are not open or transparent. These systems can encode existing social inequalities of gender, ethnicity or class into technologies of visibility. And in doing this, these processes remix us. They take our lives and identities as raw material and create us anew as profile data subjects. What gets remixed now is not just old movies, 
but you and me. Thank you very much.